get started um, for today's event. Thank you very much, everyone, for joining the 2020 Women's Equality Day online celebration today. I am Vivian Poe, Communications Director to San Francisco Assessor Carmen Chu. Carmen Chu co-founded the W Challenge Initiative in 2018, along with the Department on the Status of Women, as well as the League of Women Voters San Francisco. Our mission is to raise women's voice and their voting power. You can learn more about our initiative on our website, wchallenge.org. Before we start, I would like to thank all our W Challenge partners and supporters and our co-hosts who are listed in the share screen before um, for organizing today's event, as well as kicking off a social med media campaign as this year's challenge. We want to encourage more women to vote, especially for this upcoming election. And we will share more details um, later on in the program. You can learn more about the initiative on wchallenge.org 100 women. Today's event will stream live on SF Government TV YouTube channel, as well as the city's Facebook and Twitter accounts. So I want to thank our colleagues here from SF Gov TV for working in the background um, and for their efforts to making this event as accessible as possible for everyone. You can also feel free to share the links um, and host a watch party if you want on your preferred social media platforms because we will be having them on Facebook and Twitter. And this session will also be recorded for future references. So let's get started. Happy Women's Equality Day. May I kindly ask the president of the Commission on the Status of Women to join us, Brianna Swat, to officially kickstart the celebration of today's event. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vivian, for the kind introduction. And really thank you to all staff for making this happen. I know we would normally be on the steps of City Hall, um, but I appreciate everyone's creativity and um, flexibility of making this a virtual event as well. My name is Brianna Zwart and I am privileged to serve as the president of the nation's strongest commission and department on the status of women right here in San Francisco. It was on this day 100 years ago that the 19th Amendment was added to the Constitution of the United States in the process of extending the right to vote to women across the country. And on November 2nd, 1920, more than 8 million women voted for the first time in the presidential election. The moment was a culmination of a movement made with tears, pain, sweat, a long struggle that included activism and leadership of Black, Indigenous, and women of color, too many who were later written out of history books. These women who fought, marched, organized, and protested for decades to gain the right to vote. We are right to celebrate this day as a milestone and recognize that equal voting rights were not achieved for all women through the 19th Amendment. The Voting Rights Act passed 55 years ago brought us closer to equal voting rights. However, the struggle continues and the need for vigilance goes on. As we were reminded in 2013 when the Supreme Court gutted the law, these attacks on our democracy continue through this very hour. The tactics evolve but honestly, the intent remains the same. It was once literacy tests, poll taxes, and outright violent intimidation. Today, we see the closing of polling places in communities of color, purging of voter rolls, and attacks on voting by mail. In short, the fight continues on for the right to vote. So today is more than a day of celebration. It's also a moment to revive our commitment to continue in this struggle. It's a moment to look ahead to the next hundred years and a moment to ensure that our democracy is truly representative. Over the last century, women have also fought to gain access in classrooms, boardrooms, and elected office. With each advance, we have seen the power of women's leadership. We see that diverse voices and perspectives, equity and inclusion bring new ideas, new insights to the halls of power. We've seen that right here from our vantage point in San Francisco with our own representative, Nancy Pelosi, the first and only woman to serve as Speaker of the House, our two female senators, and now Vice Presidential Candidate Kamala Harris. 
as I said earlier, I wish we could all be gathering in person together. This is not how anyone could have imagined 2020 would look. But it also reminds us how important it is to have strong and capable leaders and how connected we are together. In honor of our ancestors, our foremothers, our sisters in this struggle, I am so proud to kick off this event and to bring together our two city female elected officials, women who not only forge the path, but always bring others along with them. Carmen Chu has served as the elected assessor for the city and county of San Francisco since 2013. Her efforts in overhauling the operations and performance of the office and successfully reversing decades of old backlog <laughs> earned her office the prestigious 2020 Good Government Award, an honor recognizing excellence in public sector management and stewardship. Assessor Chu has also recently taken on a new leadership role to co-chair San Francisco Economics Recovery Task Force, using her fiscal expertise to help San Francisco through an unprecedented economic impact from COVID-19 pandemic. On top of all this, she is vice president of the California Assessors Association, serves on the San Francisco Employees Retirement uh, System Board, overseeing investments of 26 billion dollars in public pension since in the public pension system. She also provides direction on the executive board of SPUR, a nonprofit focused on developing regional solutions to cross county challenges like housing affordability and climate resilience. In addition to all these wonderful things and all these new roles, she also has a new role as a mother and is forever a public servant, servant with her values rooted in her experience growing up as a daughter of immigrants. Thank you for your leadership, Assessor Chu, and thank you for being here. And finally, it's my honor to welcome our mayor, London Breed. In 2018, Mayor Breed was elected to be the first African-American woman and the second woman in San Francisco's history to serve as mayor. She was reelected for her first full term in November, 2019. She led San Francisco's emergency response to COVID-19 with grit and grace and is currently guiding the city's phase reopening and economic recovery. Recently, Mayor Breed announced her vision to fundamentally change the nature of policing in San Francisco and issued a set of policies to address structural inequities. Since becoming mayor, her priorities have included helping the city's homeless population into care and shelter, adding more housing for residents of all income levels, helping those suffering from mental health and substance use disorder, and ensuring that all San Franciscans have access to a thriving economy, furthering San Francisco's leadership in combating climate change, and honestly, the list goes on and on. So thank you again all for being here. I'm excited to get this conversation started. Thank you, Brianna, um, for a, such a nice introduction. Um, we will now um, ask our assessor, Carmen Chu, the co-founder of the W Challenge, to give some um, introduction remarks as we are waiting for the mayor to join us shortly. Thank you. I, first off, I want to just thank everybody, all of our partner organizations, uh, Brianna, for your, your wonderful and warm introduction. Uh, thank you all for joining us in this virtual a way I think that it's a special day, a day that I think as Brianna mentioned, women were able to win the right to vote. Uh, it did take decades though for indigenous women and women of color to also be able to participate. And so I think as we take the moment to celebrate this milestone in our history, it's also important to recognize that the struggles for participation, the struggle for representation still continues even as we speak. It is highlighted not only from what we're seeing from the federal uh, attacks in terms of women's rights and um, the place of women, but also when we're thinking about even how we are all seeing the response to COVID-19. I think it's not lost on so many of us that COVID-19, though it is a disease that impacts everyone, it has not been impacting our communities in an equal way. We've seen a disproportionate impact on our Latinx communities and our African American communities, and not only that, but also women. Women uh, bear the brunt in being employed in the industries that have been most impacted negatively by COVID-19, primarily in service sectors, healthcare sectors, education, childcare, 
And not only that, but we're also seeing that women also are playing a role, a double duty, even triple duty when it comes to not only balancing their jobs, employment, their careers, but also childcare and elder care. This is something that is uh, intimately, I think, uh, experienced by so many of us. Uh, for myself, uh, as a young mother with a 15-month-old uh, daughter and uh, having my elderly parents now sheltering in place with us, I feel that impact. And yet I find myself uh, really understanding how fortunate I am even to be in the place that I am now and to be able to still have a job. So many of the people that uh, we're talking about have lost their jobs, are on the verge of losing their businesses and their homes. And it really does highlight the importance of recognizing the impacts of COVID and the opportunity to really step up. And so today we have a unique opportunity to be able to talk about women leadership, especially at this time. I think uh, as Brianna had mentioned earlier, there's a cross section of so many things happening. In addition to the challenges that we have with COVID-19, we're seeing wildland fires uh, across the state of California that's brought about by global climate change. We're not only seeing that, but we're also seeing continued uh, challenges at the federal level when it comes to our immigrant communities uh, and people of color. And so again, we're really, really excited to have the mayor today to be able to speak more about women leadership and, and the importance of that going forward. And so I see that our mayor has joined us. And so I wanna welcome uh, London to the, sh the program. I think today it's gonna to be a very, it's gonna be a, a unique opportunity. We rarely have the chance to be able to interview each other and just have a candid casual conversation. So it'll be a lot of fun to be able to do that uh, today. But uh, just a, a moment, uh, right before you came on, Mayor Breed, Brianna was able to share some really uh, great uh, information about your, your bio. But today, I think people are really looking forward to getting to know more about you and your leadership style as we kind of go forward. Uh, so I think, as you know, we've started the W Challenge a few years ago, and you've been a strong supporter of the W Challenge from the very beginning. I think you've participated every single year that we've come together to talk about the importance of voting and women's participation. This year, our challenge is really to make sure that we are highlighting the 100-year history of one, at least 100 great, amazing women leaders. So we really want to tell the story of women's leadership uh, through the years and how we all build upon those histories uh, in order to be where we are today. So again, I'm super excited to bring Mayor Breed onto the show today. Um, I'm gonna ask you the first question, but actually before we do that, why don't I um, ask you to introduce or say a few words if you'd like to, to commemorate the 100 year uh, anniversary. Well, thank you so much, Carmen. And it's of course always great uh, being with you and, and talking about uh, important issues in our city, but more importantly, celebrating 100 years of women receiving the right to vote. And we all know, sadly, uh, with the history of this country that did not include women of color. Uh, and we know that, uh, you know, when I think about from a perspective of where we are now in this country and how there is finally a reckoning uh, that is occurring around race and around inequality and what's happening to people uh, as a result of that spark that uh, sadly involved the death of George Floyd. Um, I think this is the perfect time to, to start to have these honest conversations about this because from my perspective, um, you know, it, 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 our differences are what makes us a better city. It's what makes us a better country. I hope my phone's not too loud. I don't know. <laughs> Turn it off, but um, but um, it makes us a better it makes us a better city. It makes us a better country, and I think that it starts with the next generation, and it also needs to be embedded in uh, our young people at an early age in a way that could effectively allow for change. Because the sad reality is, we we know that a lot of this is taught in the home. It's taught. Um, you know, early on, and it develops into who you are as a person naturally. Yeah. And so we've got to get to the point of all of that, but we also have to be prepared to have the honest conversations about our differences, um, you know, how we all fit into this world, and how working together, we can make things better. And, and I got to be honest, no one does that better than women, um, <laughs> because we are, you know, multitaskers, and it's just naturally who we are. And so as we celebrate, um, you know, the right to vote for women, 
we have to also keep in mind, there was a time that women couldn't vote in this country. There was a time that black people couldn't vote in this country. There was a time that folks were discriminated against and hung just because they wanted to exercise their right. We dishonor their memory and their sacrifice when we don't show up to make sure that our voices are heard. So I think that's this, this, this celebration should remind us about those people and what they sacrificed and how we have an obligation to not only exercise our right to vote ourselves, but to make sure that we are lifting up others to do the same and that we are also making it clear to the next generation how significant it is for them to do so as well. So yeah. glad to be here. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the, the points you make really do resonate because I think that the fight continues, right? Even now, I mean, we're, we're continuing to see the inequities continue to, per, to be part of our, our daily lives. We need to really speak honestly about it. And it is really hard. It is hard to talk about race because it's uncomfortable. But unless we start to get to a place where we can do that, I don't know how we start to dismantle what's there, right? And even, with, in, even within the last COVID response, we've been seeing a lot of rise in anti-Asian sentiments and people blaming the Asian community for what's happening. And, and I think even then, we need allies. We need people to say, that's not right. That's not okay. That's not, that's not the reason why we are in the place that we are. And so I think there's a lot of, there is a lot of hurt and there's a lot of healing that we need to be responsible for. And, so, and, and also, Carmen, you know, think about, I, I don't believe there's one person on this earth who hasn't been disrespected in some way. Absolutely. And they know how that hurts and it doesn't feel good. I'm sure you've been called racial names. I've been called names. And when you think about that, why would you want somebody else to feel that way? That's right. And, and I think that we have, to, we have to start to get to, you know, the root causes of how those things developed. And, and we have to have honest conversations. And, and, and just, you know, for example, I still have people in my family who make certain comments and use certain, you know, racial uh, slurs that I have to correct. And then they are basically like, well, we always said that. And, and it, I don't do it because I'm mayor, I wanna be clear, but I do it because it's offensive to the people that we claim we respect, right? Yeah. It's like when you're using those terms, it's, and, and you don't understand that it's not appropriate because people get offended by those terms. It's like, why would you continue to do that? So don't tell me you have a friend who's gay or you have a friend who's Chinese or you have a friend who's this and they don't have a problem with it. I don't care. I have a problem with it. Yeah. Because yeah. I would be offended if someone used certain comments and words against me. Mm -hmm. So we have to also educate our family members, especially our older family members, about oh, yeah. terminologies that are just not appropriate to say about other people. Yeah, and I think I think that that it's it's absolutely true. I think the more that we can personalize and and um, share with our family what our expectations are and what what it means for people, I think the better. I think we all we all grow up with certain experiences, and we all have preconceived notions about people and we all have sh ways to shortcut what we think. But I think what is important that we recognize that they exist, right? That we might have biases that exist and make sure that they don't help, that they don't drive how we make decisions or they don't drive how it is yes. we interact with people. And I think that's what's really important. It's not to be that, it's not to say that any of us are perfect or we don't have biases, but it's to recognize that we do. Yes. And to make sure that we don't let that motivate us, right? And I think as you mentioned, when we have the opportunity to, to give a different perspective, when a family member or anybody is making a generalization about a particular community, it's to say, well, why do you say that? Because I, I don't think that that's true and that generalization actually is wrong. What would, what, if, what would you think if they said this about our community, right? I think yeah. it's, it's to make sure that we kind of do that so that we continue to grow and evolve as opposed yeah. to just kind of letting things be, right? Yeah. And so I've got a question for you, which is, you know, we're, we're in the middle of this global pandemic. I mean, no one ever thought we would 
be having to deal with something like this. And not only that, but I think as you mentioned, we're at a space where we're having conversations and we're having a reckoning when it comes to institutional racism, police brutality. So I wanna know, what does it feel like to be mayor of a city like San Francisco during this time? And do you think being a woman mayor makes a difference? Oh my God, Carmen. <laughs> I got it's, it. it's a it's a it's a big question. I mean, I, it, this no one can prepare for this kind of thing, you know. Well, I, I'll just say that you know I'm I'm very spiritual, and when I became mayor, and even to this very day, based on my circumstances, I still can't believe that someone like me could actually be mayor of San Francisco. It's still it, it's it's almost unreal. <laughs> so I wake up in the morning, I'm like. Yep, you're still mayor. And it's, it, it's still blowing me away. And then when I think about, you know, what I've come into, um, and my personal background and my experiences, uh, you know, it just, I, I was watching this one message, and it was talking about being created for a time such as this. Uh, and, and that was kind of the message. And because I, I will say that I was in my head wondering, well, what's going on here? You know, like, is this the end of the world? Like global pandemic, the yeah. fires, you know, know. The, the unrest and the protest and all of this stuff. And I was just like, wow, this is, and, and then our president, right? Like, I'm like, you can't, like, this is like almost as if I'm watching a movie and, <laughs> and, 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 and it's not real but it's real and it's our life. And what, what I realize is if I were not mayor, how would I wanna feel? And, and, and how would I want my leaders to behave in a way that helps to reassure me that things are gonna be okay? Yeah. And, and, and so that's how I've made the decisions that I've made. And by being completely honest with the public every step of the way, and also letting the public know we don't know what the future holds, which you typically as a politician should not maybe say, or people think you should not say. But I think that, you know, we as women, we're kind of realist and we feel strongly about like, I mean, for example, your mother, you know, you know how it is where you like, you want to do everything for your kids, but you also have to say, no, we can't. Oh my gosh. Well, I told you, I don't say very many, many, I don't say no. <laughs> I'm going to get you, Carmen. You know, you got to, you got to man up. <laughs> but you, 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 you got it. Like, but part of saying no to our children and, and, and is to protect them. Right. And, yeah. and part of, you know, what is important in our, in our natural, like this is naturally how we are. We're nurturing people as women in most cases, and we care about doing what's right for folks. And I think that has been a guiding principle for me because, you know, it's not easy, of course. And, you know, like, for example, you think that it doesn't hurt my heart to see people sleeping on the ground or I, it's not that I don't like seeing it, it just hurts that you know this is a human being that is sleeping on the ground. And I'm in my mind, I can't help but when I, we, but we go past and I, you know, just honestly, I pray for them. And I also ask God to help give me the strength to be able to do this job and to make things better for people. It's not about the complaints. It's about the need to try and get people the help and the support that they need. So I think, you know, in terms of governing, it's just, I am doing the best that I can. I am listening to various uh, advisors, but also members of the public with their emails and their comments and their suggestions uh, and trying to make good decisions uh, because a lot of people are counting on me. They're counting on me. They're looking, it's not London, it's the mayor as a symbol of, you know, the leader of the city. And they're counting on me to make good decisions to keep them safe. And so that's how I see my job. And it's important to make sure um, that, that we're doing what we're doing. And, and that's really why when we, when, I mean, we can't just do one thing, we have to do a lot of things. And that's why 
we, you know, that's why I was like, Carmen is one of those people that I respect as it relates to money management <laughs> and fiscal responsibility. She's like bringing in the bread, but also the accountability <laughs> and everything. So that's why I was like, she would be the perfect person to help us with the economic recovery and what that entails. And, and plus on top of that, you're very thoughtful in how you think about things because you're not just thinking about a business, you're thinking about the people because of your family, right? And, and your experience is growing up and, and your mom and dad, uh, you're thinking about those experiences and how they had to struggle. Yeah. And you know what people are going through. And so I guess I'll go into my next question, my question, <laughs> my first question to you. And it's like, as a daughter of immigrants uh, and a small business owners, how did your personal experience shape you as a, uh, a person and as a leader for a time such as this? Yeah. I mean, I, I think just going to a point that you made earlier when you were talking about, you know, you, what is what is it like being kind of a woman leader too? I I don't know. I think that what I've seen with, with you has been just this real collaborative approach. You know, I'm not sure that any other elected mayor would have asked another elected person to, to help do the work that you asked me to do on the, on the economic recovery task force. And I think that says a lot about how you approach things, which is let's, let's bring in people to help be problem solving together. And I, I really appreciate that because I, I'm not sure that, that anybody would just do that, right? So I think that, that that says volumes. You know, in terms of being, um, you know, how how it is that we approach leadership, especially as, as you grow up, I think, especially for me, I saw my, my parents really struggle, right? When when I was a young girl, I, I never saw my parents. I was a latchkey kid. My mom and dad were working every single day and, you know, they'd go to work, I'd be at school already and then, they wouldn't come home until after I went to sleep. So I really rarely saw my parents. And I think seeing how hard they work, it, it's, a, it's a symbol of sort of how, how hard it is for a lot of small businesses to make it and to, to survive. And I think seeing how they struggled, seeing how they were discriminated against because they had an accent or how people just didn't treat them the right way when they went in to ask for help because they couldn't say it right or had an accent, and that really hurt me, right? And I think when I think about public service and I think about the things that I hope to do, it's to really try to create opportunities for people and make sure that everybody knows that they're worthy. It doesn't matter where they come from or how much they have or how they can speak, they are worthy as individuals. And then I think now, especially as a, as a young mother too, I love my daughter so much. She's really changed, I think my perspective and you know my patience and I realize that, you know, when I see the love that I have for her, it hurts me to think that there are other kids that just don't have the same support, yes. who potentially are going hungry, who don't have the same opportunities to, to succeed. And that hurts me because I, I just turn that around and say, what would I feel if that was, that was for, for my daughter? What would I feel if she didn't have the chance to be loved, to be fed, to feel safe, to feel like she could be whatever she wanted to be? So I think that kind of feeling really does help to kind of pull me to say, keep doing the work that you're doing. Keep on making sure that you create opportunities, that you help people have a job, that you support families the best that you can. And, you know, we're not going to be perfect. And I, I like what you said earlier about being honest with people about where our problems are. We should tell folks, let's be honest. Here are, here's where we have problems. Here's what what I need help with doing. Here's what the city needs to do to pull things together. And we're not perfect, but this is what I'm going to do about it, right? I think it's important to tell people that because, you know, in terms of leadership, it's really important to be transparent with people because you lose your, you lose integrity, you lose the only thing that you have going for, for you, which is, you know, what, what you represent and what you say. Are you going to say the things that you say you're going to do? Are you actually going to do the things that you say, right? And if you lose that, you lose integrity, you lose people's trust. And I think that's in really uh, embedded from the lessons that my parents have taught me. But I think also, again, I think just being someone who, you know, feels, who is a mother, who kind of sees the struggle that my parents went through, I don't want to see that for other people. I want to do everything I can to, to change that. So I think being on the Economic Recovery Task Force, I think about that every single day. I think 
what can we do as a city to help just save that one more one more business, save that job so that people have the chance to, to be stable, you know, and have opportunities? What do we need to do to make sure that actually kids are not going to fall behind? Like, you know, I know this distance learning is what we have to do right now, but it is a travesty to not be able to provide education to our young kids who are going to fall further behind if we don't get it right, if we just don't figure out a way. So I think those are the things that really just drive me as, as a leader is to say, you know, what are those struggles that people feel that I know from my own background that can really help to, you know, change things. And so, you know, I, I think you and I kind of have the same experiences where we pull from that background and that it, as our foundation, really, right? It, it really is what drives us. Yes. And I think it kind of goes back to, I think about some of the conversations you and I have had uh, where, you know, we've, we were kind of commensurating over like something, something really terrible happening, like something that was just like ridiculous that was happening in our, in politics. And, you know, politics is, is tough because despite best intentions, sometimes, you know, things get said a different way or it's represented a way that's different. And sometimes things are just really hard. And so I'm curious to hear from you about what is, you know, what is it about your life or your experiences that helps to motivate you? when things are hard you know because being mayor you get a lot of criticism for things that you can control and things you can't control right and you know how do you how do you deal with that and what what kind of keeps you centered well well just think about it uh carmen can you imagine the the fact that you and i both came up under some of the most challenging of circumstances that we'd ever be in positions like this yeah. Like, I, I just, so that, it starts with that, number one. Number two, um, as hard as things are now, things were worse when I was a kid in terms of my life experience. Um, so when I tell people, like I grew up in public housing, uh, I didn't just grow up there. I had every single experience directly in my household family situation where when you, when you talk about domestic violence, when you talk about drugs, prostitution, um, grandma raising me, criminal justice system, mentally ill, all of these things, welfare, uh, food stamps, um, you know, clothes with holes in them and everything else and criticism and fights and drama and lack of access to things, anything that anyone probably talks about that they care about in terms of helping people in you know, the most challenging of circumstances, I probably experienced it directly in my household. And the reason why in some instances I don't go into depth about some of those really tragic stories is because you know, out of respect for my family members, you know, out of respect for you know, not putting all of their business out there because I'm the one in the limelight and I don't want to expose them to, you know, challenges. Yeah. You know, yeah. I'm able to talk about my sister who died from a drug overdose um, because of how it impacted me personally, you know, and, and I talk about my brother because my brother was okay that I talk about, you know, his unfortunate situation, you know, but, uh, you know, like just the experiences that I had um, when I think about, you know, like being a kid in the midst of those challenges and not being able to escape that yeah. world, yeah. Um, you know, I just, you know, that is really what drives me because I know that my experience is not unique. What is unique is that I'm in a position like this coming out of those circumstances. And, and this is why this work is so important to me because I know that there are other young, talented people out there that just need a chance. They need a chance. They need an advocate, just like you said. Yeah. They need a support system. So as, as challenging as a time that we're having right now, um, and as much criticism as I may receive, it pales in comparison to what I've experienced growing up. And that's why I feel confident about my, my strength and my ability to take on a role like this. Because I feel like I was prepared to be in a situation like this. 
um, it's, it's so interesting because yes, it's hard. And yes, it's, it's, it's sometimes frustrating um, and there are setbacks and disappointments and struggles associated with this work. Uh, but I still am optimistic about our ability to really make a difference. And when you talk about, you know, it's, it's, you know, kind of, you know, that a mayor would ask another elected official to, you know, it, it's not th just that I asked you, it's just, I also have to listen to what your advice is, even if I disagree with it, because, you know, part of that is really how I work. Because it's not just about me. And I feel like it's important as a leader that you bring other people along and you also are prepared to listen. And it doesn't have to just be your way or the highway. Yeah. And, 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 and so I think my experience of growing up and seeing how ineffective that kind of approach has been and how it's had a, a negative impact on people that grew up like me is why I do this because I want to change things genuinely. And the only way you're able to do that is by making sure you're making good decisions and you're always keeping in mind the people that we're here to serve. Um, so I, I, I want to go back. I know, you know, we're, we're talking about our, our various experiences, but I just want to jump in by, because when you first became a member of the Board of Supervisors, you were the only uh, Asian woman to serve at that yeah. time. Yeah. And I, I just want to know, how did it feel <laughs> to be on the board to, I mean, because, you know, the Board of Supervisors right now is a hot mess. Uh, and there's always a lot of drama. You know, I served on the board too, but there were other women. You left me. You, you left me. <laughs> I was like, no, Carmen, don't leave me. I went downstairs. <laughs> <laughs> but, but tell me, tell me when you first started. I mean, because you weren't trying to run for office. You weren't trying to be in politics. You know, you were just dealing with the money and the finances and trying to do your job. So tell me what that was like for you. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, for me, you know, I'm, I, by nature, I'm probably more of an introvert than anything, you know, and I think people kind of are like, are you are, that doesn't make sense. How can you be a politician? But by nature, that's what I was. And my parents were always like, you're so shy. Are you going to ever make it in this world? You know, are you going to, you know, hide behind me all the time, right? When I was younger. And, you know, I think we all kind of learn and we grow, but you know, I had been in the mayor's budget office uh, for Gavin Newsom at the time, and I just, you know, I really enjoyed the policy work behind the scenes and kind of really getting down to the nuts and bolts of things. And, you know, at the end of the day, I think when we talk about policy, ultimately, when you want to look at priorities of a city and the, and the values of a city, you see where the money is spent because that, it matters, right? Where you put your resources matters and it speaks about the, the values that we have as a city. And so that was really kind of where I, I started. And then I think um, overnight, um, Ma Mayor Newsom at the time appointed me to be a member of the board. And it was, it was under a cloud of challenges in the Asian community, right? It was a time when then supervisor of District 4 was, um, you know, under investigation. And, you know, I, I remember being the only Asian supervisor at that time. And it's a, bur it's, a, it's a heavy kind of burden in a way because you feel like you have to represent all of the Chinese community or all of the Asian community, right? Mm -hmm. And what does that mean? Because our community is so diverse, right? I can't possibly represent the perspective of every single person, but it, it felt very heavy. And, and I asked myself, why am I the only Asian American in a city where, where we have such a large population? It made no sense, right? And I, I think the other thing that was weighing heavy on my mind at that time, and it played out during my election, was that a lot of people were were basically saying that, you know, I I didn't have sort of the right to be um, the representative because I wasn't born in San Francisco, right? Mm -hmm. And there was nothing that that more kind of offended me than that to to think that if I wasn't born here, so if I was an immigrant or mm. if I was someone who, who had moved here but cared a lot about the city that I didn't have an equal right or I shouldn't have a voice, it offended me to the soul because it kind of just said, what does that mean about my parents who, who immigrated here and worked so hard? Are you saying that they don't have a right to participate or have a voice also, right? I remember when I was running, it was under this cloud of, well, are all Asian politicians corrupt? You know, 
because it wasn't it wasn't just you know, Ed Jew at the time, but there were a few other issues that had happened. And so I think it was it was just this this um, feeling of needing to make sure that I comported myself in a way that was above and beyond to make sure there was I left no doubt that that's not the way all Asian Americans behave, right? And it was also this burden of saying like, how do you like make sure you kind of represent a community and make sure that you are doing it in a way that you leave room for people to come behind you, right? Because I didn't want to be an example of, of yet another Asian American politician who was disappointing the community, right? And so I think it was just a, it was a big challenge because there was so much kind of going on at the same time. But I'm, I'm happy that we have since that time have had many more kind of folks be able to rise and actually be elected. And I think we need to continue to support that. And so I think the work that we can do to continue to mentor young people and especially young women, I think is really, really important because, you know, I think sometimes people just need to see that it's possible, you know, and I, I said that to you before too, right? It's like, you know, when someone sees that someone who has, who went through all the hardships that you went through, who grew up um, facing all the challenges that you did, were able to, was able to become the mayor, that's inspiring, right? Just that example and just seeing that is inspiring. For someone to say, I'm looking at Carmen and I'm, I'm that shy kid who no one really paid maybe that much attention to, but she can become an elected person and do good things too. I mean, that's inspiring too. Those are the examples we need to show is that not all leadership styles are the same, but we can all succeed as leaders, right? And so I think that's something that is, has been important to me as I've kind of realized, I realized this. And I think- Oh, I'm sorry, Carmen, that's a really good point about, you know, we're, we're you know, different styles of leaders, right? And, and I, I like yeah. that because, but, but we both have very, you know, unique backgrounds that have, you know, involved struggle in some yeah. capacity. And I think uh, it also develops, it also helps us to develop an appreciation and respect for one another as well, which... Um, I think is also important in the world of politics. Uh, how we treat one another, even in the midst of our disagreements, yeah. is so important because um, that's one of the biggest challenges I think that we face. And, and when we, we have disagreements and, and we start to do the personal attacks and some of the other lies and other things, it just doesn't set a good example, I think, for you know, young generations. I mean, we're just as bad as what we see happening in the White House when we go that route. That's right. So I want to ask you a, a personal question, but a fun one, which is, what is something that no one knows about you? A fun fact. Okay, a fun fact. Um, one of my absolute favorite shows that I watch all the time, people would not believe it. It's Frasier. <laughs> I, lo I love Frazier because, listen, this is a tough job. And you know how, like, at night, I, I try not to watch the news or nothing too serious before I go to bed. And most of the time at night, you know, just to kind of laugh and smile or do something more happy is I watch Frazier. I so I have to admit, my, my, my uh, guilty pleasure is watching Korean dramas. Those romantic dramas, love them. Oh my goodness, yeah. <laughs> I know, I know. That's, that's, and I, I just, I just, I, and I laugh out loud a lot of times when I'm watching Frasier. <laughs> I don't do by myself normally. So, um, yes, that would, that would probably surprise a lot of people. So kind of getting back to, a, a, back to this, uh, encouraging this idea about encouraging women to participate. So, you know, I, I want to know, what do you think about, what would you say to someone who's on the fence about participating? And, and if someone is thinking about running for office or wanting to do something where they get on an, a commission or something like that, how, what do you think people need to do to prepare for that experience? What would you say to those women? Well, what I would say is, you know, when you feel something, when you want to do something, then you should go for it. Um, but part of what you want to make sure is that you do your homework to prepare. 
uh, that you know exactly what your roles and responsibilities are in the position that you're going for, whether it's a request to me to be a, um, a member of a board or a commission that I have the ability to make appointments for, or if you decide to run for public office. You know, when I decided to run for supervisor, uh, I wanted to be a good supervisor for the people of the, the district I represent where I grew up in. And so that, in, that entailed making sure I knew how to do policy and legislation and um, I understood how the process worked and the city worked. And the good news is I'd been on commissions and other places, so I understood it. But I actually went back to school late in life before I ran to get my master's in public administration. And I ended, ended up graduating from USF with, with honors uh, because I was committed to making sure that I was the best policymaker for the people that I represented. And I'm not suggesting that you do that. It's just that whatever role you want to play, you set your sights on that role and you make sure that you're prepared to take it on and all that, will, all that it entails. And unfortunately, in the world of politics and in the world of public service, it also comes with its fair share of criticism. And I think it's, gonna, it's really important that you have thick skin and yeah. it, it, it's, it's important that you have, and, and I'll tell you, I made some mistakes along the way because, you know, I want to be honest, I'm a girl from the projects. So don't come for me unless you want me to come for you. <laughs> and so I've made some mistakes early on where I've cursed some people out and did some things. And what I had to realize is if I want to represent people, it can't be about me anymore. So I can't do what I typically would do if it's just me when I'm entering the world of pro politics. So I had to grow a lot in the position. So part of it is just really making sure that you, you make yourself into the best person you can be, you do the best job you can be, and you remember that you're there representing other people. So don't let yourself get in the way of that. Yeah, I agree. And I think, you know, I, I second the point that you make about sort of just making sure that you're prepared and know what, what is what is required of you. And I think it's also about being prepared to make hard choices because, oh, yeah. you know, it's, it's easy to kind of just fall with the rhetoric and where the wind is blowing, but it's really hard to not go in that direction because you think it's the right thing to do. And I think that's what people are asking of us when they ask mm -hmm. us to be leaders is to say, based on what you know and, and, and what you want to do for community, is this the right choice or is it not? And sometimes it doesn't, it may not be convenient, right? It may just be the thing that is not the, the most popular thing that people want you to do, but it, but you think it's the right call. So I think it's important. And I think two other things that you mentioned earlier that I think is, is really important is optimism. If you're not somewhat optimistic about being able to make change, politics and public office isn't for you because you've got to be tenacious. You've got to, you have to believe you can do something because yeah. it's, it's easy to get discouraged if you don't. And I, a, a story of tenacity, I don't know if you remember uh, London, you and I were actually on a um, on a trip to Israel yes. right before <laughs> the mayor made an appointment to the District 5 seat. Do you remember this? Yes. yes. And, and I remember, so, you know, ultimately the mayor ended up appointing someone else, right? And, and London still ran, right? She's like, well, I'm still going to run because I still want to do this. And she ended up winning, right? But I remember on that trip, I just, I remember seeing you, you were like, you were like what's going to happen? I'm thinking about. She was thinking about it the whole time. Like even though we were kind of looking at different things, learning about you know the diaspora and all of that stuff, it you know you knew in in her heart she was tenacious and she wanted to do the job because it came across right. And so I think those are just a few other things. You've got to be optimistic and you that you can make change and be willing to really work hard to get there because some the changes that are most worthwhile are hard to get to. Yeah, and, yeah. and I just want to add, I know we got to wrap it up because I see your communications person. <laughs> ready to go. Um, I just want to add that you also, I think it is important that you are really prepared to make the hard decisions. And at the end of the day, when you make that decision, is it the right decision, not for your political career? Is it the right decision for the people you represent it? Never lose sight of that. Yeah. Don't make decisions to get elected. There were a lot of things that I supported that no other candidate supported when I ran for mayor and people were trying to tell me to change my position. I said, but that's not fair to the public. 
They need to know who I am as a person and the kinds of decisions that I get, I'm going to make. And that's what's so critical. Don't change who you are to fit into a yeah. position. I think that's where sometimes people go wrong because of what they see in the political climate. Yeah, totally agree because, you know, ultimately something has to ground you, right? The things that we talked about, about the things that motivate us to do good, if you start keep if you keep on changing what that is, I don't I'm not sure if you still have a direction anymore, right? Yeah. So, I yeah. totally agree. Well, so I've really enjoyed our conversation. It's been Thank a lot you. of fun <laughs> chatting with you. Um, and really just kind of, I think it, it offered people a really unique look into how you think about things. And, you know, I, I think it's a great opportunity to just highlight, you know, an um, the amazing job you're doing. So thank you for all of your leadership, especially during a hard time and for joining us. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Vivian uh, so that she can help us wrap up. Thank you, Madam Mayor, and thank you, Madam Assessor, for such a great conversation. I really hate to interrupt and uh, come in and end it. It was such a great conversation for <laughs> all your stories and sharing your thoughts and the passion behind running for offices. Those are really great lessons for us to learn. So at this point, I also want to just quickly go into our W Challenge 2020. As you may all know that ever since the W Challenge has launched, we have been creating a new challenge every year to uplift women and also trying to encourage more women to vote, especially for this upcoming election that is so important for all of us. So we are gonna be running a 10 week social media campaign starting from today and all the way up to the election day. We have a hundred of women from the past century that we have selected. They are local, they're great. They've been part of all the um, suffrage movement as well as other um, social justice movement as well. So we encourage everyone to go on our website. I'm gonna be quickly going into it, sharing it on our screen right here. If you go to our homepage, you, all you need to do is to click on the 100 years of women um, leaders here, then you can read about uh, the details of our campaign. But basically, you just need to select two to three women each week and feature on your preferred social media um, platforms, hashtag W Challenge, and encourage more women to do that. So we were hoping that by uplifting these stories, we are able to um, encourage more women to vote and take leadership, just in honor of all these women that were before us and all that they have done to grant the right that we have today. So thank you so much for everyone who's joining us. We are inviting our um, partner as well, Alison Go, president of the League of Women Voters San Francisco, here to give us the final remarks to end today's celebration. Thank you. Alison, the stage is yours. Thanks. Um, thank you for having me today. I am so touched and uh, really energized to hear the stories and experiences of Madam Assessor and Mayor Breed. Uh, you know, both just as a young woman and an immigrant, just really thank you for your leadership and sharing these moments with us. Um, thank you for everybody who helped plan this amazing event today. I know normally we would be on the steps of City Hall, but this is pretty great to hear everyone's stories. And I know I can feel the energy throughout San Francisco. Um, and a huge thank you to our volunteer coordinator at the league, Kathy Barr, who's really helped to uh, put this together uh, on, our, on our league behalf as well. Uh, my name is Allison Go, and I'm the president of the League of Women Voters of San Francisco. And we are a nonpartisan volunteer run organization focused on nonpartisan voter education and advocacy efforts here in San Francisco. Uh, you know, this election is unlike any other election before and with unprecedented challenges. Every single time we hear, this is the most important election yet, but, but really it's actually true this time. Um, and with COVID-19, the state of California has mailed every single registered voter a mail-in ballot. And this is really, really great. Um, but many of our fellow San Franciscans may not be used to this voting process. And there actually is a lot of misinformation out there on how to get your ballot, how to transmit your ballot and election security. So the first step is making sure you're registered to vote. Um, if you're already registered, you'll automatically receive your ballot during the first two weeks of October. And if you're not registered, or if you've moved recently, or maybe changed your name uh, and need to re-register, uh, remember that the voter registration deadline is October 19th. Um, you can register to vote uh, or re-register on our website at lwvsf.org vote. Um, we have links to do all of these things. 
Um, and then again, if you're not sure, sure of your voter status, or if you're kind of like me and you just like double checking sometimes, uh, you can double check your voter registration um, online, same site. Um, you can check which address they have on file to make sure that you get your ballot in time. Um, and if all of this seems like a lot of stuff to remember, don't worry, just go to lwvsf.org slash vote and help make your plan to vote, whether it's mailing your ballot in, dropping it off downtown at the Bill Graham Auditorium, or even dropping it off at your local polling location. Uh, just make sure that your vote is counted this November. Um, this, the League, also, we put out a lot of nonpartisan voting materials. Uh, for example, our pros and cons guide offers an easy, uh, helpful, easy to read explainer for each local ballot measure. Um, each, then the guide is actually put together by our diverse team of volunteers, and we translate it into Chinese and Spanish to reflect our community here in San Francisco. Next month, we're also hosting candidate forums for several of the Board of Supervisors races, uh, specifically Districts 1, 7, and 11. These are free. They're going to be open to the public. We will broadcast these over Zoom, and we will post them afterwards on our LWVSF YouTube page, and they will be broadcast over at SFGovTV, thanks to our partnership with them. And guess what? These can also be found on our LWVSF.org slash vote page. Um, this page will be updated throughout the fall as more of our materials come out. So there'll be a really great one-stop portal for all of these information. Um, so thank you for having me these next nine weeks. Let's get our friends, family, neighbors, uh, colleagues to commit to vote and to make sure that they have a plan to vote, whether it's in person or with the mail-in ballot. Um, please go to wchallenge.org to highlight 100 years of amazing women, uh, especially some of the women here today. Uh, thank you for having me and please stay up to date on everything the League is doing. You can follow us on Facebook or on Twitter. Um, or, or by visiting us at lwbsf.org. Thank you. Thank you, Allison. And I just saw in chat that we are also having a series of events coming up also for five o'clock today. I believe the league is having um, a partnership with the Mechanics Library and also talking about the suffrage movement. And tomorrow um, with partnership with the Public Library, our Glen Park Neighborhood History Project is also having a presentation about the first suffrage march that is happening and was led by a San Franciscan from Glen Park. So stay tuned. You can also visit wchallenge.org um, under events to check out those um, activities.